I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Richard and Microsoft for the invitation. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. I enjoy uh, Belgium. Um, he didn't tell me I was in for an interrogation, though. <laughs> yeah, lights are on. Interrogation. <sighs> are the doors locked? <laughs> so thanks for your time. Um, a little background on me, um, so you know who's speaking to you. Currently work for Royal Bank of Scotland slash Nat NatWest. Um, been there about five and a half years. And prior to that, I actually worked for Microsoft for about a decade, nine years in actual fact. And before that, I worked for IBM for uh, 12 years and before I did computer science at college. So I've been an IT guy my entire career. So, so that's me. Uh, I find uh, what we do very interesting and I um, seek to, whether I was on the vendor side or within a bank side, I seek to focus on the strategy and to try and influence that. Um, so I'm constantly thinking about the future. And so my team um, has been looking at open banking uh, and the whole um, adoption of APIs, both externally and internally, for the last um, couple of years. So Richard asked me to, <coughs> it, it's a big topic, right? I'm just going to get see what time I'm on here, 10 o'clock. Um, <coughs> he asked me to cover, in particular, what open banking means to a tier one bank. Okay, so that's, that, that's what I'm going to emphasize. And I will talk about that. And then I'll move on to a project that we have done uh, where we got some help from Microsoft um, just, to, just to make it real. And this is, this is a real thing I'm going to be talking to you about as well. So this question then, what does open banking mean to a tier one bank? Well, we know it's driven by the regulator, right? Both at the European level with PSD2 and within the UK, it's been driven by uh, Her Majesty's government. And effectively, the regulator <laughs> are, is demanding, or regulators, I should say, are demanding that we open our digital doors via APIs, right? And we are opening these doors principally to fintechs. Of course, it's customers and other banks as well that are coming at us as fintechs. But that's what's happening. And we're providing access to data and services. And we cannot refuse. We cannot charge for the service. And we cannot enforce a contract. How does that make us feel? <laughs> does anybody think this is a good idea? If you're a fintech, you'd say yes. If you're a tier one bank, I think the answer might be no. Did I get the accent right there? <laughs> on top of this, overlaid on this, there's a conversation and a narrative that always happens. And it's around the concept of innovation, right? The whole point of opening doors to fintechs is to enable new solutions, new kinds of solutions, specialized solutions. And so it raises the question as to how can it help the, the large banks themselves innovate. And what I've done in this slide is I'm dividing out the innovation into two, two buckets. One is external innovation and then internal innovation. Looking at it externally, first of all, we can see that fintechs can offer solutions that are far richer than what we could <clears throat> in terms of their breadth. Let me give an example that you will relate to. With Apple, you remember they became, first of all, when they launched the iPhone, they didn't have an I a, a store. They eventually did have a store and everything in that store was from Apple themselves. And then they came under pressure from the market to open that store to third parties, which they did. And now if you go into that store, there are millions of apps, right? 
And the percentage of those things that are created by Apple is very small. And so by opening to the market, they got a greater range of things. Now that exact same thing will happen in banking, right? As banks open their doors, fintechs will come, and the market is more powerful than any bank, no matter how big the bank. The market will have more solutions, often targeted to niches that the bank is not interested in, right? Because the bank can't possibly invest in solutions for every single niche, right? You just couldn't do it. And so banks tend to, particularly large banks, tend to focus on the main line solutions for the majority of our customers. Okay. So that's how we see this working. We're going to see tremendous innovation now, over the next couple of years, driven by fintech. But what are the, what are the banks themselves going to do? Are they just going to wait and see what happens? Of course not. We see this as an opportunity to improve the rate of our own innovation internally. And so we want to use these APIs ourselves and create solutions that are rich so that a customer doesn't have to go to the market. They can stay with us. There's many customers that just feel comfortable with a solution that is wall to wall their bank and branded by their bank and so on. But the problem with very large enterprises, not just in banking, is that we easily smother innovation. And so the challenge we face is, how do we not prevent it? Right? We want to encourage different teams within the banks to come up with ideas and to quickly, quickly create solutions using APIs. And this uh, mantra here, uh, Code Wins Arguments, is famous. It comes from Facebook. And that's their argument. They say, if you write the code and it works, you know, it's a candidate for release. So don't argue for months about what's the strategy and who's the customer segment and so on. That's the way enterprises have always worked. Right? We're, we're slow. But we need to change and we need to speed up to be relevant in this new, new world. And of course we see that then as an opportunity to drive culture, effectively to re reboot our culture because as we look back to the past, we see that that culture is not appropriate for <coughs> this new ecosystem. And we need to be prepared to disrupt ourselves because that will not be comfortable. But if we don't disrupt ourselves, you know, we will be disrupted. Now, what is the most important thing in innovation? I would argue it's not the bright ideas, it is pace. You remember the um, clock, uh, the little watches we all used to wear, and you would put it to your ear and you could hear, hear the tick, yeah? Tick, tock, tick, 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 tick. I mean, these modern watches don't do that, right? We miss that. And so. Many of you will remember that in the early days of PCs, we used to measure the performance by the speed of the clock, didn't we? The clock speed. And the faster the clock speed, you could turn something around, the faster was the computer. And so I remember one day asking myself the question, well, what is the clock speed like of the Royal Bank of Scotland? Does it go tick, 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 tick? Or is it like a grandfather clock? Does it go tick? So what's the answer to that question? A uh, good answer. But we're not alone in that. All large enterprises are like that. So pace. Now, I won't go through every quote here. Um, my favorite one is this guy, Tom Peters from the States, very famous um, management consultant. And someone asked him this question one day. Uh, and you can find it on YouTube. I recommend you go and watch him on YouTube and search for Tom Peters and Bias to Action, and you'll find it. And they asked him this question. Tell us the most important thing you've ever learned in innovation 
in the enterprise? Great question, right? And he said this. <clears throat> he said, there's only one thing that I've ever learned for sure. And he said that it was those that try the most things that win. So it's not the genius idea you have in the bath and cry, Eureka. It's you try something, and on the back of it you try something else, and a third thing, a fourth thing, a fifth thing. And many of these ideas will feel, but that's okay. That's good, you're learning. That's what he said. And, you know, that, I was thinking and reflecting on that, you know, that's so not how we work, right? In the enterprise, we... We, 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 we scratch our heads and think around a proposition for a year, a year and a half, and then we decide to go build it. And, you know, maybe two years, maybe three years later, you've built something, right? And it may be appropriate, it may not. So <clears throat> that change, this change that we're going through here, is uncomfortable. Now, within the bank, then, we've been asking our questions as we've been moving to open banking, thinking about open banking, creating the APIs, doing all the necessary work to provide these APIs, we began to think about, well, well what, what are we going to do? Right? Apart from providing those APIs, we want to provide some of these fintech-like solutions to our customers. And so I'm going to tell you a story. And this story was, began last year. And most will know that the key category the killer app for open banking is what we generally call PFM, right? Personal Financial Management. Providing one portal into all your finances, whether it's with your home bank or other banks or credit card companies, mortgage companies and so on. It's, it's that idea. And so we set ourselves a challenge internally. Could we build one of those? Rather than expecting our customers, there's, going to, there's many on the market already, there will be many more. And are we just going to stand to the side and let that happen, or are we going to create something? So we began to imagineer something last year. It looks like this. And, of course, it focuses on categorizing your expenditure so that I'm not looking at just a set of transactions now. I'm looking at categories of spend, and I can see, do I really spend that much on lunch? Do I really spend that much on coffee? And so on. And helping our customers manage their, their money easier. Richard used the term... It's absolutely correct. Frictionless, making life easy. Right? That's what it's about. So we imagineered something and then asked ourselves the question, you know, can we build it? Can we build it fast? And the answer to that is, and not in two years, yes we can. Is Bob the Builder popular over here? <laughs> like it is in the UK. Okay, so how are we going to do that? How are we going to do this? Well, first of all, you've got to break the rules, right? All, all the way we do things in the past is, is, not, is not appropriate in this new way of doing things. Um, and I could talk for hours about this. So I've just pulled out some highlights. You need to put the engineers in charge. Not the paid program managers, not the project managers. The engineers <coughs> need to be entrusted to work very closely with the business to, to create this solution. Another vital thing, which is maybe obvious, but it's almost impossible to make happen, is to create an MVP, a really minimal viable product, and get that minimal thing working quickly, and then iterate it. And although anyone who's looked at Agile says, yeah, absolutely. But you know, enterprises don't work like that. They work waterfall. Our finances work waterfall. So that needs addressed. Once you've imagineered something, you, know, <clears throat> you need to distract the imagineers. Let me just um, draw a diagram here. You see this diagram here? <clears throat> There's a line here, and above it's imagineering, and below it's engineering. Now, the way enterprises have worked in the past is you have a project, right, and it's vertical. You own something from the look to the build and the data. But what I like to do is draw a diagram with people with my arm and say, okay, if you're above this line, this imaginary line, 
and you're building the proposition, that's good. But don't you think to tell the engineers how to build it? Just leave the engineers to that because the engineers will be working at the cutting edge and if you're going to innovate, you won't build on what you've, you've had in the past. They'll use the most, you'll give yourself, I like to use the expression, every accelerant, right? You're creating a, a Formula One race car, you, you make it light, you make the fuel light, you, you, know, you tur turbocharge it, et cetera, et cetera. You give yourself every advantage. Because you're going to build a rail system and not a mock system, anybody can build a mock system at a, at a weekend hackathon, right? But if you're going to build a rail system with real customer data, then you need to get to your gatekeepers early. Privacy, security, governance. Because you will not ship that up unless they give you the blessing, right? We're, we're in a regulated industry here. But at the same time as you talk to these different constituents within your company, they're very happy to work with you to take them on the journey, but you need to take them on that journey. And that, that's what we did. We, we partnered really with those individuals so that when we finally came to be ready to ship this app, it had that imprimatur from all of those individuals who can't really help you but they surely can stop you. Right? Super important. Traditional project managers, program managers, that come from the waterfall world, they don't know anything about the tech. Okay? So you can't do this in traditional fashion and you cannot promise a date. Of course, they always want to do that, right? And hold you to that date. What is it? What is SAS? Who knows what IaaS is? Put up your hand if you know what IaaS is. Infrastructure as a service. And then we've got platform as a service, PaaS, which is the moment. And SAS is what? What's SAS? Hard oh, I've one got it here. <laughs> I, I was trying to trick you to say um, software, as, uh, um, software as a service, but I really mean the SES here, right? In the sense that you want a small team that can go in below the radar, blow up the bridges, take out the airport, and leave no bodies behind, right? <laughs> That's the style. You've got to do it, right? And you tell the story afterwards. So it's a real application in six months and the plan is we're extending it now to a thousand individuals 900 of which will be internal staff and 100 will be actual external customers and we'll get their feedback and iterate this application now although six months isn't six weeks six months is a nanosecond in enterprise clock speed terms right and so we're adjusting we're moving into this pace place um, we, 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 we will welcome third-party PFM applications, but we will also create our own and many other categories like that of, of a really important areas uh, within the bank. And so we have um, gone through, I would say, a huge learning curve, but we feel that we have moved the enterprise forward by going through this whole journey and experiment. And later on uh, in, the, in the session, I'll be happy to talk more detail. If any of you are technical, I can go through more technical details with you. If, if, if you're more from a business point of view, happy to talk through the process and the justification. And I even have it on my phone, so I can, it's live, <laughs> and I can demonstrate it to you as well. Thanks for your time.